Great. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience in the waiting room. Um, my name is Jen Balkas. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a faculty member um, in the EPI department at the School of Public Health and part of our CIFAR. Um, I'm here with um, the co-director of the Big Heart today, Dr. Karina Walters, um, who's there as well, and you'll hear more from her in a second. And we're delighted to welcome everybody um, and our fantastic uh, group of panelists who are going to be sharing um, about mentorship. Uh, and so just a little bit of the format before we um, turn things over to them today is we'll just go through a quick a few slides. Um, this is being recorded. We know that uh, many folks have scheduled conflicts. Um, and so lots of individuals tend to review our sessions uh, later. So we want to just give folks context about what Big Heart is and what um, folks can offer. And this is a program that folks across the UW and um, uh, individuals related to the University of Hawaii and really across the country have been able to uh, participate in through having this remote uh, remote session. So before we get, as we get started, oops, Marcus, can you advance the slide, please? So we want to take a moment uh, at the UW uh, to acknowledge the space that we're uh, learning in both physically and uh, in this virtual space as well. So we learn and teach and live or on and near the ancestral homes of the Coast Salish peoples whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. The UW Seattle campus is situated on the traditional territory of the Duwamish people and the Coast Salish peoples and many other indigenous peoples continue to thrive in these lands alive and strong. I'm grateful to have you all here in this, um, in this virtual space today. Next slide. So as I mentioned, this is um, this program and this session today is part of a larger uh, Big Heart um, uh, initiative. And as part of this and uh, sponsored through our CIFAR, there's various opportunities for individuals who are earlier in their career, particularly undergraduate and graduate students who are uh, indigenous or potentially interested in HIV research to get to know more about the field in HIV science. So one of the ways that we do this is through mentorship and pairing opportunities. We connect folks with um, people conducting HIV research across the field. So this is from basic science to social science and really everything in between. Um, we help folks to, to identify potential internship and job opportunities. And those that attend our, our series regularly can become Big Heart Scholars and they have the opportunity to attend the principles of STA and HIV research uh, public health course, which is known all over the world. Next slide. And as I mentioned for this series, um, we have sort of two ongoing series. So this is the third in um, a series related to mentorship, particularly focusing on mentoring the mentors to better support our indigenous scholars, particularly related to HIV research. We also have a seminar series, and this has really been like a foundational component of the program where we feature research from indigenous scholars uh, that have, are focusing on different aspects of HIV science. So the schedule is listed here um, for the our 2023 sessions. Um, if, if you want to take a look at those, you're able to learn more about the program as a whole, as well as the schedule through the QR codes. And uh, Marcus will be able to put the links in the chat as well after once we've transitioned to the panel. And lastly, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Walters to introduce or sort of give a quick introduction of our panelists and we'll let them speak um, for themselves and introduce themselves more. So go take it away, Karina. Well, great. great. Thank you, uh, Jen. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I wanted to extend my thank yous to this incredible um, group of panelists. I've had the pleasure of working with everybody like 20 years or longer. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we were involved in a, a group to produce some papers on um, mentoring to mentors. So this is a great panel to come forward and to address some of these issues. Um, I first I wanna introduce Dr. Cynthia Pearson. Uh, Dr. Pearson has had an extended uh, work and career in HIV research and mentorship um, from Zimbabwe to uh, Yakima. <laughs> she's she's uh, been uh, global all the way to local with respect to working with uh, diverse communities. Uh, she centered a lot of her work with indigenous populations in collaboration with uh, tribal communities, uh, most recently in the last, uh, uh, I guess probably the last 15 or tw almost 20 years, huh, Cynthia? Mm -hmm. um, and then Dr. Jane Simone uh, is a, a clinical health psychologist and she and I have been partnering together on research work for well over 30 years. And, uh, and I've had the pleasure of working with her on a number of HIV related projects. Uh, she is the current co-PI uh, for the Indigenous HIV AIDS Research Training uh, Grant in its third iteration. 
And so she has a lot of experience in being able to talk about um, uh, mentorship as well. And especially also, uh, she and Cynthia are talking a lot about allied perspectives, uh, as well as Dr. Wadia Udell, who um, I've had the pleasure of working with um, uh, through one of our INSPIRE programs, uh, who she's working really closely with a number of our Native um, trainees. And uh, she's done incredible research in, in HEV, sexual health, and other areas. Um, uh, and she's also a psychologist out at uh, University of Washington Bothell campus and currently a lead administrator there. Um, I, I'm with, with you, I'm going to let you say what your official title is, uh, if you like. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm just grateful to have all of you here and really excited to go. And, you know, I'd like to start with you, Dr. Uh, Widya Yudal. Please let us know a little bit about yourself that you want to extend more and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, this topic. Uh, thank you, Karina. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm Wadia Udell. I am a developmental psychologist uh, at the University of Washington Bothell campus. Uh, my research focuses on STI, HIV prevention, and high-risk youth, youth in the juvenile justice system, and youth in the foster care system. I am currently the assistant vice chancellor for faculty success, so that's the title she was talking about. Yes. <laughs> um, so <laughs> a different, uh, more kind of more broad mentoring kind of uh, job there. I almost made you a provost just then, so. <laughs> oh, you made me the president. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank All right. you, Lydia. Yes, and so what did you want to me to ask, answer? Well, let, let's go ahead and start the conversation. And and if, you know, we, usually what we do is just open it up for maybe five minutes from each of the panelists to kind of highlight some of the things they, that they've been thinking about. And then we make it much more conversational and opportunity to uh, talk amongst ourselves around uh, some of the issues that we've encountered um, in, in mentorship and challenges right. and strengths. So thank right. you. Yeah. So I've, I've been mentored by many, many amazing women um, from uh, graduate school through my pro stock through um, my junior faculty position and then still till today. So um, mentoring is, is definitely something um, that I think good mentoring is, is necessary um, for a healthy uh, research and academic careers. Um, one of the things that I think through my experience and then mentoring uh, junior researchers and junior faculty, both people of color and people who are not people of color, right, white people, <laughs> um, is that, that to be, I think for me, one of the key things is to be thoughtful about what their goals are to to understand who the individual is first and foremost and be responsive to what their individual goals are which may or may not be aligned with whatever their position is right so kind of just really starting with a position of not trying to be the mentor but understand who you're working with and what their needs are to better to then understand um, how to help them meet those needs and and being flexible and I think this was one of the topics that I saw on the list but being flexible about how you define what success is how you define different types of pathways I find particularly for for researchers junior researchers of color the pathways the goals are, are different the reasons why we enter are different um, and so what we want out of the field that what we want to use science for in some ways are different lots of more hands-on community-based collaborative work um, and I think that's important to recognize because it leads to different questions of how to be successful, right? There's the pathway that's pretty traditional. So, you know, and then there are various others. And sometimes we don't know what those, actually oftentimes we don't know what those other pathways are because we have taken the one that we have, right? And for many of us to be in a situation where we are now, we've pretty much followed the same pathway by and large. Um, and so being able to be aware and humble about the fact that you might have to learn about other pathways to figure out how to help your mentee, I think it's really important. So I'll just want to start it off with just being open with who your, your mentee is, what your role is, what success is, and how to get them there, I think has been one of the key um, features of successful mentoring. Uh, thank you, Dr. Udell. Uh, Dr. Pearson. Yeah, I would totally agree with Dr. Udell. I mean, I actually have some of the same things in my notes, um, but, you know, I, I think about some of the things, what helps me along my path. And I think 
So I took a very circuitous route coming to the PhD program. Um, started off with only an eighth grade education, still doesn't don't have a high school degree or a GED, kind of just happened in a wrong line, started testing for college courses, and here I am. And it was the mentoring of a lot of wonderful people that got me to this point. But something else that they shared with me, especially coming from, you know, eventually I did go get my bachelor's degree and then my master's, but coming into the PhD program, that's a whole different way of thinking. It's a whole different way of writing and just having somebody to kind of sit down with me and have me look at a sentence and how those sentences and the words within those sentences and how those sentences join together to really kind of come up to um a, a thought that holds together, like maybe I have to practice even in my, oops, there, streets changed, um, was really beneficial. And I think that working with a lot of people of color, like Dr. Adele was saying, we don't take a straight path. And sometimes we miss out or they miss out on some of those essential educational components that need some support in bridging through. Um, so I think that was really helpful. It was teaching me and, and thinking about the writing and then also how to think or the formulas behind different academic requirements. In other words, how you write a paper for a class is very different on how you write an academic journal paper or how you write a grant. Each of those have different type of components or a different formula, if you will. So having somebody to really explain that, what are the components? Yes, this is the method section, but you don't write a method, a grant method section the same way you write a paper method section. They're similar but they're not the same. And understanding what those different components are and helping to guide, well, in my case, my mentor is helping to guide me through that thinking process, but as I mentor others to help kind of sit down and clarify what those sections are, what those roles are, and what those constructs are and how it folds together. So those have been some of the things most helpful um, for me, and then I have taken those gifts that have been given to me to those I mentor as well. Great, thank you, Dr. Pearson. Dr. Simone? Yeah, I'd like to say first, it's a privilege and honor to be on this panel with two people who sometimes have been ease of mine and other ways and times have been mentors of mine and has, have also been colleagues. So it's really fun to do the panel with these two great women scholars. Um, I'll say a couple of things. My training has been very different from Cynthia's. I had all the privilege and opportunity in the world to go to the one of the best high schools in the country, college, graduate school. So I had uber privilege um, and opportunity uh, with my training. And I had, in some ways, I had very good mentoring. In other ways, I had uh, mentors who really weren't so active uh, mentors. I remember one mentor when I was graduating a PhD program, I asked him if there were any jobs he knew about um, that I could apply to. And he said, oh, you're interested in, in looking for a job. This is my last year of my talk. What was I there for eight years for doing? <laughs> my, but that is so just no forward thinking or whatever. But ends up he's a great guy and we're still in touch. And I learned in other ways from him. But there are many ways I think back in my career why I'm interested in mentoring is because I think about what I wish I had and I didn't. Um, so, but just to say a couple of things about, because um, this is big heart um, for white mentors um, working with native uh, scholars. Um, if that's something of interest, um, I'll just say a few things. I, there are a few resources. It's very scary for a white person not to have a PowerPoint or something written down, so I can't really just rely on my oral tradition to speak. But I know, does, um, Marcus, I think uh, there were those three articles. I don't know if we can get them sent to people who are on the call. Um, just a few papers on mentoring the mentors, um, and specifically around Native issues that might be helpful. But um, I would say some things to keep in mind what's different for white people Native uh um, thank you. Um, uh, mentoring Indigenous scholars is there's just the underrepresentation in the academy of Indigenous scholars. Very few of um, us white mentors knew any Indigenous scholars or know of them or had many students who were Indigenous. So there's a lack of familiarity and, and knowledge about an Indigenous experience. 
Um, and so some people will say things um, like when they meet, uh, and they just goes, well, are basically asking, you know, are you really native? Uh, how much native are you? Or did you grow up in the reservation? Do you speak your language? Like ridiculous questions that have no relevance for your role as a mentor that that mentee maybe want to share with you at some point in your relationship, but just aren't relevant to your experience. And I think it's a little different also, unlike other racial ethnic groups, it's very interesting, um, uh, uh, just association or relationship with native people in this country that white people, I don't know if other groups experience this, but what people will say to native people um, that they think they are native or they wish at least in this life or another life, or they wish they were native, or they feel a kinship or spirituality with native people, or they have an animal spirit and, or can they tell them what their animal spirit is? There's these kind of racial, there's microaggressions that I think are different than many other uh, racial ethnic groups. And I think it's because of a lack of familiarity with this population and um, a lower, you know, lower population, low prevalence. There's not as many folks in the, in the academy from an indigenous background. So I would say to white mentors um, that we need to, and we, we can't rely, of course, on our mentees to educate us, though we're very fortunate if they do at times, but we need to find out about the people we're working with. Um, you can get references, you can ask me, you can ask other white people, try not to bother native people with something we should be doing on our own doing research, look at the PBS series about the history of Native Americans in this country, um, go to events, read um, books, articles, um, some popular, some fiction, nonfiction about Native people. So try to just increase your awareness and education about Native people so you can be a better uh, mentor uh, because there's just so much to overcome. <laughs> I'm Jane, did we lose you? <laughs> He's like left. Okay, there you go. <laughs> we lost you all of a sudden, Jane. Are you there? I am there. Um, another thing you should remember is to <laughs> plug in your laptop when your <laughs> battery dies. You can actually <laughs> you want, but that that probably was actually probably a place I should stop, huh, Karina? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, our, so far, with our three panelists, I just wanted to. Um, help to contextualize a little bit of something that all three panels have hit on and maybe we can dive a little deeper in, but uh, to your point, Jane, you know, the invisibility isn't just about numbers. Um, even when we have more critical numbers, we still run into this problem of people trying to um, uh, harness our experience and tell us what our experience is supposed to be and decide whether you know, we're, we're, we meet the criteria for their version of Dances with Wolves or whatever. Um, and so this this happens even with numbers. We still we still encounter that. So that that's just by way of context. That's part of the issues of addressing settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is designed to erase indigenous people from the land, from our imaginations, from our realities, so that um, you can replace it and put your story, you know, the settler story, into that um, into that frame. And the result is in the academy, native. Native faculty and Native students feel incredibly invisible, even though they're hyper visible being, you know, you know, dealing with racism in the everyday world, that invisibility means that they're constantly doing checks and balances about whether or not they want to talk about certain things with their mentors. And it's a constant checking in with oneself and doing that. So I just wanted to highlight that that, that is a level of kind of a, a chronic burden that a lot of our, uh, our Native faculty and, and students uh, encounter. And certainly I can give you a bunch of those. And of course, Jane addressed something else, which is the microaggressions that are tied to that invisibility means that people romanticize or they insert these crazy ideas into what it means to be a native person in, in the modern world. And, um, you know, I, I've given the example where I've been asked to dress as an Indian to give a lecture before by somebody. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, they asked me to come in a costume. So these things are real, they do happen. And, um, and that wear and tear is, is, is a different kind of stress. It's a stress. Uh, in that environment. Uh, so I appreciate you suggesting, you know, people getting out and getting their own resources and, and getting connected to community and serving community, because that's one of the things that our communities talk about. So more to the questions to the panel. Um, uh, I really, I really love uh, where your guys are, are thinking on this. And I want to ask you, what was most surprising or what was your, your challenge or what did you learn um, that is different than working with other communities of color. And you're, you're all working with American Indian, Alaska Native communities, you know, and we've talked a little bit more generically about 
serving people of color, but for American Indians, Alaska Natives, there's some unique, potential unique issues that might arise. And can you talk a little bit about anything that might have happened that you have learned from or that you would like to highlight in terms of uh, helping other people mentor as allies? So I, if I can start, I think, yeah. um, because I think it connects to what Jane said to, to also your question, I think um, that oftentimes, so it's not just white mentors, right? So it's non-Indigenous mentors, right? So I am not Indigenous. I am Black. I'm African-American. Um, and oftentimes, I think in an effort for any underrepresented group, right? So uh, whatever that group is, in an effort to identify with, try to understand, right? So we might not be asking, I'm not going to ask Karina to dress up in a costume to come give a, give a lecture, <laughs> nor am I going to like try to conjure up some lineage that doesn't exist to try to make a connection to, right? That's another thing that you see often. <laughs> um, but I might do something a little bit more uh, mundane or subtle in the sense of when hearing about my mentee's experience, try to tie that to my experience as an African-American. Um, and sometimes there are ties, but many times there are not ties, right? And I think by not recognizing those, just listening, listening, knowing that, um, I think one of the big things about mentoring um, indigenous scholars is knowing what your lane is and knowing how to stay in it, right? So like, what am I, why did I get asked to do this, right? What am I bringing to that experience and what don't I know? So there's a lot that I didn't know. Fortunately, I knew there was a lot that I didn't know. Um, and so one of the things that I think was more uh, surprising, just to answer your question um, more directly, one of the things that was more, that I didn't, I wasn't quite aware of was the, the, in, the level of engagement in community when it comes to not just like just all of the research with coming up with a research question to with trying to figure out a timeline with getting involved like all of it from the very 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 beginning of just like it's not okay have a research question and go see if there are you know it's like I, I I don't know if that's a good research question right you know so so and not just because it's a scientifically not a good research question but like I have to talk to the tribe I have to talk to the elders I have to talk to people in charge to figure out if that that was something that I I mean I think I knew but I did not know no right like you can't write your method section until you have a conversation about what that's going to I mean it really does add it, it, length, it extends the length of a project in many ways that you have to be prepared for. So some flexibility about what timelines look like, um, some openness and to back and forth about what the research question can be, right? Oh, all within the realm of whatever the person wants to study. But the they're just really the, the kind of level of control that we typically have over our research project does not exist in the same way. And I think that that when you're mentoring someone, and I'm not mentoring, I'm mentoring someone who is a junior scholar. She, um, one of the mentees is, uh, hasn't graduated yet, right? So, so in that perspective, you know, there's a strict timeline. You want, you want to make sure that people get what they need, but what they actually need is this other thing too. So kind of understanding how to balance that. That was something that I, I realized that you have to, um, really not try to control the process in that in the same ways. I mean, you can guide it, right? You can, but it's really truly collaborative in a way that honestly, when working with a lot of other communities of color, it is not remotely that collaborative, right? It's it's definitely like um, we have a question, we're coming in. Is this the question you like? <laughs> yes, yeah. okay. but it's not help us construct it. So that was something yeah. that. Yeah, the more, the deeper the deeper level of engagement that's absolutely required. Yeah, others jump in. I would just expand on what Dr. Dell said. Is is that the whole community process and also recognizing and honoring that process? It, I also feel like it just 
lends itself to better research. It opens doors to new ideas, new ways of doing things, and even new ways of thinking. And I think in mentoring Indigenous scholars, it's just like, like providing that guidance and sometimes helping them to, to serve as a buffer on the academic end to help facilitate the, the way they would like to do research from an indigenous perspective, because I think it's going to move our science forward in a way that we have not even expected. And I also feel the more that we can get indigenous scholars into research, the more that we're going to have a bigger, better, more developed worldview, because there is a way to look at the world that Western ideologies and perspectives have not even seen because of these shutters. Um, so it is a new, different approach. Um, so I think as mentors, it's really like being, like Dr. Adele said, being open um, to these new pathways, these new ways of doing research, and then also helping to provide that guidance and the, the buffers for the academic end to give Indigenous scholars the space in order to do a research um, the way that works within their communities and for their communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I loved how my co-panelists talked about um, how difference, how diversity is not the problem. Sometimes that's how it's presented, right? The problem of diverse mentees and what are we supposed to do and how is, how is difference? How, how are we going to deal with that? But it's a strength of what our mentees bring to us. It's a strength mm -hmm. to bring to the community um, and to the research. Um, and I'll say, uh, if we don't acknowledge that, we misguide them in many ways. I think it's uh, what I see that uh, the Indigenous scholars versus some of the other mentees I've had, they're just pulled in so many directions, you know, which in my very narrow way of thinking, I, I see like some of my students with uh, white backgrounds or more privileged educationally can really focus in a way um, on one particular topic or one, uh, one particular approach. But often with the indigenous scholars, they're working with the communities, they're wanting to do something that's going to have more relevance and impact. And it's a little harder to move, um, you know, along the same path in the same way um, as other trainees have the opportunity to do. But um, I love seeing that as something that's a strength, something that will make the research better in the end, more relevant, more sustainable, more generalizable, um, and more easier to implement and actually have a, a, a larger impact in the end. Now, I think uh, I'm circling back to what you just said, Jane, is um, um, easier to implement because it's like doing that work in the beginning and then when you do roll out, you have full community support. You've got everyone together to really kind of bring that um, research through. And then also to pay attention to it, because we know when we do research, we put our best foot forward, everything, we think it through, we think we've got it, we move forward, we hit the field, and it's like, oh, we need to reassess what we've done. <laughs> Um, but you want that community feedback and having that community involvement all the way through, you'll get that community feedback faster and you can be able to make those adjustments. So what you're developing is really something that is likely to have um, faster impact. In other words, it may be able to get to the implementation field at a greater rate um, than you just go in a traditional way. Uh, yeah, I would just add for uh, this context for doing HIV research with Native communities, part of the challenge is um, Native communities know HIV is an issue, but it's not always a priority issue because mm -hmm. there are a lot of structural issues, a lot of other issues that are are considered priorities. So part of the challenge is working really closely with our trainees and mentees to be able to navigate the priorities of the tribal community they're working with and also helping to extend and help community begin to think about ways HIV or sexual risk or sexual health can also be part of that conversation. And so it's a little bit of this um, uh, deep back and forth between community and trainee and mentors in helping to navigate that process. Um, and that, that's a little bit, I, I think, I think maybe that's where Woody is also talking about that level of all of these deep work that you have to go into because you're dealing with HIV also on top of it. So 
Um, we have a question um, from Ananya, um, and, and that is, how do we honor Indigenous methodologies, ways of knowing, and traditions to support projects by Indigenous students when a department is very post-positivist and value only Western knowledge? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Great question, too. I think that's where your mentor needs to come up to the table as faculty of that department and help push that forward. And that's uh, easy, um, especially if you're the only one. Um, but I, I think by really trying to highlight the benefits from a new framework and that contribution to science may help. Um, I mean, maybe it. I've been fortunate to work with, in the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute under Karina and Tessa, and I know they've done a lot of the heavy hitting and really having to come to the table and really having to push agenda through. I do know at the University of Washington, our IRB has been very good, um, not readily open in the beginning, but we went, we went in person, we sat down with them, we've had conversations with them and really kind of move it forward and they i've had my irb administrator go out to co communities to get a better understanding of what's going on to help move the protocols forward um but it does definitely take some education on on our part and um in some areas are a lot more supportive than others and yeah I think it's a great question because yes, yeah, some departments are so kind of logical, positivist. I, one time my student said, didn't know she could do a dissertation with qualitative data. And I said, you know, she's, can I do a qual dissertation? I said, you have to do a good dissertation, whether it's qualitative or quantitative or however, but now I think do they have to have like fMRI data to do a dissertation. It's gone so much in the other direction of um, like, like narrow knowledge base. But I think it's it's a really good question, of, and I think it does fall on on the mentor setting the example. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, advocating for that body of knowledge being valued is, I think, is a start. But I also think there are a lot of different examples of uh, successful, highly regarded work that use uh, indigenous methodologies that are in pretty classic journals, you know? So I think there are, there are quite a number of um, well-regarded indigenous scholars who've been doing this for a while. And quite frankly, I think most of them have used multiple methodologies, have combined the Western methodology with the indigenous methodologies. I think having a sense of that can help you argue mm -hmm that these are methods, right? That are that are mm -hmm. getting different types of data that can work together with each other, that this method that you don't know about is, is very valuable in this way. I think they just don't know. Some of them don't wanna know too, no doubt. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the advocating for change happens. But I think that's one of the many advocating for change for an indigenous scholar in a program, because if they're not even willing to listen to the use of using indigenous methodologies for indigenous scholar what is their experience in the rest of their their everything in that program quite frankly right so i think it's one of many ways that we have to advocate but i also think knowing um having examples and knowing that that this i mean these questions aren't new right so all the indigenous scholars who have been doing um this work for a while karina 30 years, right? So she clearly had to answer this question 30 years ago. So I think just looking at, you know, no, for real, right? And like looking at those models to show these are, this is, this is excellence. This is how that works. And it, and it's not, it's not an either or, right? It can be a both and, and the, and, you know, in the extreme of the really, really rigid programs. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point uh, from everybody. Thank you, uh, Wadia. Um, I think one of the things to think about is that we've, we don't tend to interrogate and break down the culture of the the culture of the environment we're in, um, and what becomes a normative standard is part of a cultural system and a way of thinking. And so, part of the work that some of the indigenous scholars have done, in particular, is, is just to start to name that. And say, well, wait a minute. There's a particular frame 
on on this approach and you would what do you call it positivist or or you know whatever but it's beginning to help the environment start to realize even the language that's being used um you know when they talk about you know oh we got to address the diversity problem the diversity issue it's problematized problem. Now you hear that kind of language all the time. And so when something becomes problematized, it's a reflection of the norms of what's operating in that department. So it's an opportunity really to begin to shift perceptions and perspectives. And even well-intentioned people might go, wow, I didn't realize I was even participating in that and I don't want to anymore. So how do I change that? So this is where, and, th and this should not be done just with people that have indigenous scholars as mentees, it should be at all schools, right? So I, that's the other thing is I want, I hope that people begin to think about indigenous approaches and methodologies as a really a, another way to really be very expansive and, and, and rethink about how we approach things. Um, so the culture of the environment. The other piece is the reason why we need to change the norms of the environment is because quite often the, most native faculty are, are the only one in the whole department or the school. So it's an N of one. Uh, there's not very many. Uh, so um, making that change means we have to have allies at the table. Uh, really working closely with us and hearing our voices and centering our voices when, whenever possible. So um, that's just another piece to, to keep in mind and part of the invisibility problem. So, um, you know, I think Indigenous peoples have much to, uh, to share and certainly um, have some really fantastic breakthrough approaches. Uh, Land-based healing is a great example, uh, moving beyond systems of care that we currently have um, institutionalized and service oriented programming. Uh, Native people are saying, well, you know, we need to get outside and bust outside of those service oriented places. They're important, but that's a band aid. We actually have to begin to think about um, doing things much more innovatively that are aligned with our approaches to healing. And since dispossession of land and disconnection from land is one of the hallmarks of settler colonialism, a lot of Native people are saying, well, the way to heal is through land. And so people are developing land based healing approaches. And so there's very innovative opportunities here to for collaborators and, and collaborations for mentors to work with their their mentees and, and you know reciprocal learning. I think that's what I'm hearing from all of our mentors today. It's important to it's three six you know three sixty mentoring. Everybody's learning from each other and um and, and not in a way that's uh, abusive, <laughs> you know, do you teach me, but in a way of a mutual understanding and mutual respect. And um, and that's where it seems to thrive. So more questions that uh, Michael Luella pointed out that it was really important for us to consider doing all of these good things and deep engagement everywhere, not just in indigenous communities. And I, I agreed. <laughs> um, and I think Badia was trying to point out also some of the unique challenges, tribal, dealing with tribal sovereignty, dealing with tribal governments. I mean, there's layers <laughs> um, that are really institutionalized um, in, in tribal communities that, um, pose other kinds of challenges that you don't typically see. Other questions or comments from the panel? Thank you, Ananya. Other thoughts that the panelists would like to share with anything uh, that they've learned, strengths and challenges, approaches, anything unique about, again, about working like with indigenous populations, like being the only one in their school, <laughs> for example. Uh, you guys are all doing internship. You're actually providing um, support to colleagues who are not at your school. So that also puts a level of burden on you as mentors as well, because you're taking on support and allyship um, that it's not always centered in your academic institution. And I think that is another unique feature of working across indigenous communities. Maybe I could say something might be kind of a little bit basic for this group, but for especially for white faculty uh, mentors to keep in mind is that it's okay to, to talk about the things you don't know or to talk about um, if if race is, is impacting. They just to bring it up as a topic of conversation. My mentees, I'll say, you know, even when they come to interview to work with me in the doctoral program, I'll say, well, I'm a white faculty member. You're not white. How, how will this, what will you need? What can I provide for you when you're here? And I try to find a secondary tertiary mentor uh, from that person's community um, that will provide some of the support they'll need. But um, I think it's important to ask about that or something will happen in class or something will come up and um, we'll try to ask them, you know, do you think that was because you're a native that that faculty member said that? And do you think your experience was different or did people in the class have a different experience? Did you see that differently? 
because of your cultural background. Um, so I think just being able to talk about that things, it's hard. White people aren't brought up to, to notice race. We're supposed to be colorblind and not see these things or pay attention to them. And we, it's hard for us to bring it up sometimes. We feel like we're awkward. We don't want to offend our mentees, but um, we have to take a chance and, and try um, so that it's better for the mentee and they know they can bring these things up with us when they want to or, or when we need to. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, also being a, a pro discerning, if that makes any sense. So sometimes a mentee won't say that mm -hmm. it's because of that they're indigenous. Um, if we're spe speaking specifically because they're indigenous, but it could be that they're another person of color. But in this particular instance, I'm talking about indigenous and they, they won't say, and they may not even know, but you might get a feeling like, wait a second, like, you know, in your experience of mentoring lots of different people, <laughs> you might have never heard of anything like that before, right? And I think to question for yourself, you know, this might, this might be a bias or this might be because they have complete ignorance around indigenous populations. And this might, you know, and then potentially even bringing that up so that they don't have to, right? You don't have to like, so that you can say, hey, so this happened with one of my, um, so uh, a mentee was on a job interview and it was the oddest, there were a lot of odd, things, statements that mm -hmm. were made, questions that were made. Um, and the mentee is from a part of the country that uh, and have that has pretty significant um, indigenous population, but was applying to a job somewhere else in another part of the country that did not. So she was completely unprepared to deal with what she didn't even know what it was. Like she had no idea how to put what her experience into a context of what was going on. Like was, it, she left the interview feeling like she was, did not understand the question. She wasn't able to answer the question, you know? So then there becomes all of this, um, you know, belief about her own experience and her readiness to be um, a researcher. And as I was listening, it just didn't seem right to me. It was bizarre. Um, and so I started to ask more and more questions just about her experience. Like, okay, so where is this place? Like, do they have, does this entire, the entire university have an indigenous or American Indian studies program? Does they have, like, so all of these questions started to lead me to think like, okay, this is not you, right? This is not you at all. This is them, right? And they're, they're literally in an in, inability to be able to see you for who you are, hear that you have a community that has certain needs that you want to work with, that you know, like, they just couldn't even see it because it was, it was so racist that they couldn't see it. And so I think helping just kind of starting with that mindset of not necessarily letting you know sometimes they'll know and they'll be able to tell you but i'm just be suspect and then not to make sure like everything is like oh no that's racist like you don't want that right but mm -hmm. at the same time like i think you know for ourselves just asking like is that is that is that what i think it is does that sound right and then you can talk it out without implying that something happened that didn't happen right but through the conversation of opening it up we it can be easier and i think from that point we've had a really good relationship right and i also honestly brought in some indigenous scholars to be like hey am i wrong about this does this seem weird um and to help her out right so so you know i can say that's bs this is what they were doing. But I'm saying that as a non-Indigenous scholar, it would also was helpful for her to hear an, an, an Indigenous scholar say, yeah, and, and this is how you need to feel and be and get through that. And so I think as a non-Indigenous scholar, one of the things that I think is really, really important is to be able to connect the mentee to an Indigenous scholar in some way, right? And it's not a burdensome, I'm not saying like, you know, go out and like, I'm not, you know, it's not do my job, but it's like, they need a community that has a lot of different <clears throat> skills and assets and resources. And having an indigenous scholar is 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 one of, I think one of the primary needs. Um, and so even if you're in a situation where there's no one else at your university, I mean, if you are actually mentoring a indigenous 
uh, junior scholar um, and there are no other people in your university, it might be helpful to actually make relationships, networks and form rela relationships with other indigenous scholars across the country. Because it seems odd to not have anyone that you know, but then therefore you're like the mentor for this one person. That seems odd to me, right? So if I were to put it in a context of like, I'm going to mentor as black scholar, but I know no black researchers. That's weird, right? <laughs> so, so I think yeah, the numbers are significantly smaller, but still, I think it, it's up to us to take the the do the work to kind of make sure we are expanding our network so that we can help our mentees. I saw Joshua Marceau. He wrote a comment that you've had some good mentoring experiences. I didn't know if you wanted to say something. That's okay to ask you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was a young tribal college student and um, became interested in bench science through a, a research program that was being established where they were looking at FIV um, infection in mountain lions in Yellowstone National Park. And so that was my first experience as um, someone who grew up on a reservation being exposed to uh, to research and it was really, I don't know, proposed and the, the program was engineered in a way that was culturally relevant. Um, and that kind of spurred my interest into pursuing biomedical research. And so I spent some time in Barney Graham's lab at the NIH um, and actually finished my postdoc here at Fred Hutch with Julie Overbaugh. Um, but yeah, I've been very, very fortunate to have extremely supportive mentors who really pay attention. Um, and it, oftentimes I was the only one. I, I think I was the only postdoc, native postdoc at Fred Hutch uh, almost the entire time I was there. Um, so yeah, it's extremely isolating. But um, again, having having very thoughtful mentors in science it matters so much. So I do want to thank you again. Thank you, Joshua. Where, where are you now? I am still at Fred Hutch. So I stepped into the program manager for the indigenous initiatives um, in the DEI core about six months ago. And I also am trying to figure out how to decolonize research, okay. generate interest among tribal college students, um, in an institution where it's not very well established. And, you know, I've, I've rotated through indigenous led research efforts that have been extremely stimulating. Um, so I know what that feels like and it feels good, but how to actually build that at an institution like Fred Hutch is extremely difficult. <laughs> well, um, it's good. Thank you that for being here with us today and, um, Know that you have a group of supporters here who uh, certainly would like to see you continue to succeed in that effort at Fred Hutch and for your own career. So we're we're here. So thank you all. Yeah. Other thoughts um, from either whoever else is in our panel world, <laughs> or from the panelists. I, I just wanted to say um, I'm very appreciative, you know, of the fact that what Wadia expressed a little bit earlier too about the importance of being an ally doesn't mean, you know, just relying on your trainee to help you understand indigeneity, indigenous issues and stuff, but also really making those connections to other indigenous researchers to pull in not only for support for the trainee, but also for support for your ongoing growth as a, a mentor. And um, I, I highly recommend that. I think that's really uh, important. Um, you're not expected to have answers. You're going to make mistakes. Uh, we all do. Uh, when we have cross-cultural encounters, it's, that happens. So I think the key is being able to sit in that space and, and be comfortable in that space and to be able to work it through. Um, uh, and, and I think Woody also highlighted something I wanted to, to mention is, you know, not over-identifying either either through guilt or over-identification with, with trainees when they're in a place and they get triggered 
um, you know, something really sets off a cascade of questioning themselves or, you know, trying to discern, is this a racist moment or not, trying to figure that out. Um, it's important to be able to step back and sit and hold that and listen and be there and begin to ask the questions, is it, is it not, and begin to explore it in healthful ways with the person. But joining prematurely in a way that it through over identifying or because you are of, of privilege guilt um, <laughs> at, or to mitigate your own settler anxiety, that kind of thing, it is not helpful. Um, that that actually can be really counterproductive and um, and harmful uh, in the long run for for indigenous trainees. It's much more important to sit with it, work it through, begin to think it out, ask for consultation, invite consultation in if you need to. Um, to put your minds together to work it through. Um, and I, we talked about that in an article we just wrote, but it, it, I think that's really an important point. So thank you for with you for starting to, to raise some of those, those issues. Other thoughts? And any questions from, from our audience? Wanna make sure we open up enough time for questions. And I was going to encourage folks if folks want to actually ask their question directly, we could feel free to come on video or come on yeah. mute and we can have yeah. more of a discussion in our final minutes. So this has been Jenny's on. Jenny Romick has a question. Jenny, go ahead. Hi there, Karina. Hi, Jenny. Uh, and ni nice to see people I know and, and know of. <laughs> um, um, so this was super helpful. Thank you. Um, for those of us who are um, our mentoring white students who are going to go on and be junior faculty. How should we be preparing them for these roles? Oh, that's a good question. So actually mentoring the potential mentors yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who are not necessarily indigenous. That's a great question. I mean, it's something I've, I've, I think about with, with my white mentees and talk about, but um, kind of, you know, are there mistakes you see junior faculty making? I would say faculty. Uh, let's pose that to the. I have some ideas about that. Um, and woke culture of Seattle and some of the potential downfalls um, with respect to uh, what what some of the research literature talks about colorblind racial ideology that permeates institutions. Um, and there's a press towards um, either over identifying or. Uh, uh, quickly jumping to the side of the oppressed or bringing up your own oppressed statuses, whatever they are, to try to make that connection um, and how that that's not always helpful. Um, and so anyways, I'm going to just kind of put that out there as, as kind of the thoughts to to get started with response to your question. So, Jane, you look like you had it. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something a little more, just more practical that um, I have, we have a lab, right, for my trainees. Um, they're they're going to go off, my graduate students are going to go off and be hopefully junior professor somewhere. Um, and so we have a diverse lab, so they learn from their colleagues, and then they encourage them to mentor a diverse group of mentees. Mm -hmm. um, that way they learn to practice some of the things that we're talking about. They learn to become mentors, and they, they talk about the, some of the difficulties and challenges of joys of already mentoring, mentoring while they're in graduate school. So if they have the opportunity to have a diverse lab they can learn from, and then they have practiced their mentoring when they're already in grad school, I think that goes a long way. Great. I'd add that um, I think when a lot of times junior faculty are, there's a little bit of fear to mentor um, because the assumption is that uh, they, you know everything, right? That, and so I think this goes back to, to, and they might not say it, but I think there's a little bit of trepidation there. Um, and so you're being put in this position where you're responsible for someone else's development and you're a junior faculty member, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this happens generally, but I think one of the things for white junior faculty who will be mentors, and I would say everybody, but you said white, so I will say white, um, is that they should, they should, know that they don't have to know everything. And I actually think that's one of the best mentoring examples, right? That I don't know, but I will find out, right? And so, so not having to have a quick answer, and I think sometimes needing to have a quick answer and a response leads to that over, over identification, that quick 
quick jump to say, yes, you're right. You know, so you, you know, just being able, Karina talks about sitting with it. And I see being able to sit with it when you know, it's okay that you don't know. Right. Yeah, so I think exactly. you can sit with the ambiguity and the lack of your knowledge um, when when you're OK, that'll bring I think that's huge. Right. And then having them say it's OK to ask everybody else around you. Right. So being comfortable with your lack of knowledge, not assuming you have to know everyone, everything and letting the mentee know you don't know everything. You need to figure this out and that you're going to contact all of your peers to do that. I think that's huge for junior faculty. So they're not having to try to figure this out on their own. I think you actually was leading right into it, um, Adia, is that networking that you have as a mentor. I mean, you're not going to know everything, but recognizing what gifts you do bring to the table and what is missing and then being able to or, you know, connect them to your other networks. We have huge networks. We have people who can do this and do that, and you're not going to be able, like I'm a quantitative researcher. I can't do qualitative work. I'm not going to try to mentor somebody through qualitative work. And so if you just take that whole concept and expand it, and they, and they say like a mentee should have multiple mentors. And I think if you can mentor your mentee to understand that, that's going to be the best because you can help with some things, but you're not going to be able to help with all of them. Um, and, and you've been saying that since the beginning of this conversation, but I, I, that's such an important point. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, um, audience uh, members who, uh, especially those who participated and asked some questions today. Thank you that, for that. Um, I want to th say thank you, uh, panelists, for spending your time and expertise and wisdom and sharing that with us today. Um, I want to remind folks of the diversity of our Indigenous communities. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach here. I think people have really talked about the importance of individualizing and really, really meeting the needs of the trainees that you're working with. Um, and that's a diversity of American Indian experience and, and uh, honoring tribal sovereignty as well. So the, it's a lot of opportunity, but networking is, is critical and key. And uh, that's absolutely true. So thank you so much, panelists. Uh, and so for that, uh, I think we're done for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. We have one more actually panel coming up in May. It's the third part of our series, which we've invited uh, Dr. Angelique Day and Dr. Chris Kemp, who will be joining us to share their perspectives as early career Indigenous researchers in the field of HIV and, and related fields. So we'll get to hear kind of from the, again, that 360 approach of, where, of um, mentoring and mentoring the mentors. But this was such a phenomenal discussion today. Thank you all again for joining us. And, um, and hopefully everyone has a great rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. If you guys uh, 